So I'm going to talk about personality disorders as an important uh, comorbidity in HIV AIDS. Um, and to accomplish that, we will examine some objectives. So the general presentation of personality disorders, which I've shortened to PDs in the slides. And then what's the relationship really between personality disorders and um, HIV? What are the different ways in which personality disorders can affect the environment of care? And what are strategies for facilitating a reduction in anti-therapeutic interactions and sort of fostering more uh, productive interactions with more difficult patients? And discuss the impact of working with personality disorders in uh, people living with HIV. So I think often when talks like this happen, a lot of it is based on the patient and what needs to happen at that level. But I think an important piece is sort of our interactions with the patients as frontline staff and what we bring to the table. So we're going to spend some time on that as well. So um, before we begin, I want to do a little background exercise. So. You should each have a cue card. If you don't, there should be one on an empty chair beside you or in front of you. So um, on the front side of the, take a few moments, reflect on a difficult patient, like a difficult interaction you have. You know, it might be the most recent one, it might be the most difficult one you can remember and you're, you know, working with uh, people living with HIV. Um, and you know, on the front side of that card, what I'd like half of the room, so the right side, Dr. Kabbalah's half, I'd like you to actually write down two lines the patient would repeatedly say during the course of this interaction. And then for the left side of the room, what I want you to do is to write down um, what emotions the patient was likely feeling. So just single words, please. And then on the back side of the card, everyone's gonna write down how they felt during that interaction, what feelings they were experiencing. Again, single words, please. So I'll give you a few moments to work on that. Okay, so if you just want to hang on to the cue cards, we're going to make a reference to it periodically through the course of the talk. So, um, what are personality disorders? So before I get into it, I should, um, you know, specify it's not, the goal of the talk is not to come away knowing the distinct personality disorders, all 10 of them in the DSM. I don't think that's important. I think it's more important to get a general gist out of how a personality disorder might present and what sort of cluster of personality disorder you're looking at, as opposed to knowing that this is a histrionic personality disorder, this is an avoidant personality disorder, that's not very important as a frontline worker. So, um, you know, generally speaking, the DSM defines personality disorders as, you know, a way of an enduring pattern of, um, you know, interacting and behaving that deviates quite significantly from social cultural norms. The behavior tends to be very pervasive and inflexible, um, and it's present fairly on in, early on in life. So as early as adolescence or young adulthood, um, these personality traits have manifested themselves, and they tend to solidify over time and lead to significant distress and impairment in terms of their interpersonal lives. So there are 10 personality disorders, as I alluded to, organized into three clusters. So the clusters are cluster A, B, C. So cluster A, sometimes referred to as the mad cluster. I apologize for the quality of the graphic. The coloring is a little different here, so it's not as clear. Um, so cluster A is referred to sometimes as the mad cluster. And this refers to, you know, personality features where, where people have a high degree of mistrust. They doubt the motives of others. They're very, very um, hypervigilant about what's going on around them. They might be perceived as being weird, odd. They, have ma they might have magical beliefs. They also have their thought process engages in some very pseudo-psychotic um, thought processes. Now, cluster B, also referred to as the bad cluster, the high energy cluster, the unstable, emotional, erratic cluster, you know, comprises of personality disorders like borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, and narcissistic personality disorder. So the um, patients with these disorders or strong traits of these disorders typically have a high level of difficulty with mentalization. They really can't see things from others' perspective. They appear to have very limited insight as they don't um, respond to social cues very well very, very low frustration tolerance and um, high emotional dysregulation. So they might go from zero to 180, you know, from being relatively 
um, you find it to being quite intensely angry within seconds, and they tend to have mood swings, fluctuating moods. Uh, cluster C, also referred to as the sad cluster, describes anxious, fearful personality types. So um, people who have um, a bit of an inferiority complex about how others see them, whether they're liked, and need a lot of reassurance around whether their contributions are valuable. But at the same time, despite seeking help, despite seeking reassurance, they appear to reject um, advice. And there's the other end of the spectrum where there's a lot of rigidity, can't really look at a bigger picture because they're caught up in details. So we're talking about people who have dependent personality disorder, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, and avoidant personality disorders. So like I said, you know, the specific disorders aren't important. It's more like, it, what's more important is the clusters and what they tend to look like. So, um, the, in summary, personality disorders capture a dysfunction in the way people think, dysfunction in how they regulate their emotions, uh, dysfunctional behavior, and difficulties with social learning. They do not respond well to social cues. Um, they, in addition to which their personality traits are quite excessive and rigid given the environmental context they're in. So it causes them a lot of functional impairment, which we're going to touch on quite a bit because this is sort of the basis of why we might have a lot of difficulties interacting with patients with either these personality disorders or strong um, traits from these disorders. And, you know, we don't really have a good understanding of why this is the case. We know that it's something that's um, caused by a number of different factors. So there are genetic factors. People who have family members who have a personality disorder are more likely to have a personality disorder. At the same time, we know that at the genetic level, there are differences in things such as how they metabolize serotonin, for example. So people who engage in a lot of self-harming behavior, a lot of impulsivity, there are actually distinct differences in um, not only how they handle serotonin, but in the way in which their uh, frontal cortex works. So it's not just um, behavior as we see it being volitional. There's also a neurobiological basis to the personality disorders. And what we see as a personality disorder is really a complex interaction between genetic factors, you know, neuroanatomical neuro differences, the social environment, and biology. So we often hear of patients with personality disorders, as we read histories, um, described as having had a very traumatic early life, having had a number of uh, stressful events, having had uh, difficulties establishing uh, relationships with their peers. However, not everyone in this, with this particular makeup obviously develops a personality disorder. So there's an underlying susceptibility to developing a personality disorder. So how prevalent is personality disorder in people living with HIV AIDS? So our pretest really, like, but just by a show of hands, how many people think that um, people living with HIV AIDS have a higher personality disorder rate than the general population. How many think that it's higher in people living with HIV AIDS? Just by a show of hands. So one, two, three, four, five, six, okay. And how many people, oh. how many people think that the rate of personality disorders is similar between the general population and people living with HIV AIDS? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It. And how many would say it's lower in people living with HIV AIDS? Okay, good. All right. So, I mean, generally speaking, anywhere from 4 to 15 percent of the general population is thought to have at least one personality disorder. The rates are certainly higher in certain populations. For example, people living with HIV AIDS people who are um, incarcerated and men as compared to women. And the types, the cluster of personality disorder is also quite variable depending on the setting. Most people never actually find out that they have a personality disorder. So now looking specifically within people living with HIV AIDS, so these disorders tend to travel in packs and it's estimated that anywhere from 20 to 40% of those living with HIV actually have a personality disorder. So it is higher than the general population. 
And um, in men, their HIV status is more strongly associated with um, the presence of a personality disorder. We don't really have a good understanding of why that's the case. Some people suggest that because certain personality disorders, such as antisocial personality disorder, is more common in men, like three to one men to women, it would again be more likely to be common, like sorry, it would be more frequent in people living with HIV AIDS, which might be why there's a stronger link between men with personality disorder and an HIV positive status as compared to females. Now, the triple diagnosis where the person has, is HIV positive, has a personality disorder, and a substance use disorder. These are patients who are incredibly difficult to work with and have a number of challenges through the course of their lives that interrupt their ability to establish relationships, their ability to engage in a therapeutic alliance with us, for example, and also has a direct impact on their course of illness. So it's estimated that up to 50% have what would be described as a triple diagnosis. So when I talked about significant functional impairment, um, I meant you know, difficulties understanding why or how their behavior has caused problems. They have limited insight, not solely because it's volitional, but because they're actually, they're wired differently. They have difficulty taking um, a lesson away from what they've just experienced because they tend to they tend to be in highly emotional states, which interferes with a lot of social learning. Uh, they have difficulty adapting their behavior to situational cues, for example, and intense difficulties coping with everyday stressors. So stressors that might not, um, you know, unhinge you or I or the average person can be an incredibly um, difficult stressor for someone struggling with personality disorder. So, uh, you know, the basis of all this is they're not really able to function in, in an adaptive manner. And the interesting thing, though, is that many people can't function in an, ad an adaptive manner, which means it's somewhat misleading. I mean, does difficult behavior always mean it's a personality disorder, or are there other things that we need to be, you know, concerned about? So uh, we're going to explore this through the use of a case. So case one. So Ryan is 38 years old, briefly incarcerated for theft, released once it was discovered that he was actually a patsy and had no real role in the crime. Once he was released, he was admitted to an HIV residential treatment facility with uh, dual goals. So to minimize his crack use, which he started in prison, and where he also acquired hepatitis B, in addition to restarting his um, antiretroviral, antiretroviral uh, medications. So Ryan is observed to have very low frustration tolerance. He frequently erupts in anger, lots of self-directed aggression, head banging, scratching himself. On one occasion, he became so frustrated, he smeared his feces all over his bed after receiving essentially a timeout. Um, he has difficulties with inappropriate behavior, so he was observed to be masturbating under his covers, and he seemed genuinely surprised as to why people were um, offended, because he had covers, he, ha he was under his covers, his door was slightly closed, and no one could really see him, so he wasn't really sure why it caused so much upset. And, you know, his behavior frequently caused a lot of confusion and frustration for clinicians who really didn't understand where it was coming from. I mean, so what's going on here? I mean, what other information would be helpful to you to try and understand uh, what's going on with Ryan's presentation? I mean, Ryan has uh, borderline intelligence, and um, people with lower borderline intelligence frequently try and mask their inability to process information. So they're intelligent enough to recognize that you know they functional they function somewhat differently than the average person. And so they go to great lengths to, to obscure that, which can cause a lot of confusion because as clinicians, if we're not aware, we might assume that, oh, you know, here's this person with this very difficult personality. This is all stemming from a personality disorder. But it's really important to be able to distinguish because the management is somewhat different. People with borderline intelligence actually do quite well and are redirectable when very simple, concrete um, redirection is given. That same thing is not observed with people with personality disorders. So in Ryan's case, you know, there are a few things that sort of stood out to staff. So for example, his genuine 
um, surprised that people were upset by the fact he was masturbating when in his mind he was under the covers and couldn't be observed and therefore was having a private moment. The other thing with him is that the reason he was incarcerated was because he was fooled into participating in criminal activity. He actually had no sense of um, his role and as a result was released once it was discovered that you know this is someone functioning at a lower level than the average person. So other things to rule out. So neuropsychiatric manifestations of HIV, <coughs> delirium, dementia, other medical disorders of the uh, CMS, and then obviously the psychiatric disorders because when those are present, it's really hard to distinguish the psychiatric disorder from an underlying problem with, for example, a personality disorder. So other things that need to be ruled out would be substance use or withdrawal, um, domestic violence. These are in, in terms of domestic violence, when I first came across that, it looked a bit odd to me, but as it's explained, um, you know, people recovering from domestic violence will sort of, they, they range between being exceedingly timid and being very inhibited seeming. So looking like an avoidant personality disorder to becoming very, very intensely emotional and dysregulated and appearing to have like say a borderline or histrionic personality disorder. Now, why is this topic important? We've looked at some of the numbers. It suggests that, you know, this is certainly something we should pay a little bit more attention to. Um, so there are lots of reasons. I mean, when you look at the epidemiology between um, personality disorders and HIV, there's a lot of commonalities. So adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, um, external, a perceived external locus of control. So these are people who frequently blame the environment and blame others for their misfortune. They don't understand why they're being blamed because they don't see themselves as having done anything wrong. So a failure, an inability, not a failure, inability to account for their own actions, inability to take responsibility for their actions. And, um, you know, there's a lot of commonality in terms of the degree of impulsivity and obviously with addictions as an example of impulsivity, for example. So people with personality disorders, particularly the cluster B, so your high energy, erratic, emotionally unstable personality disorders, such as borderline personality, have a much higher risk of acquiring HIV. Um, and these personality traits are actually linked to health behavior choices and therefore the course of illness. So certainly some, an important topic. So compared to those who have HIV but don't have a personality disorder, those with HIV actually tend to cope in a more dysfunctional manner. So they, there are high rates of substance use as a coping mechanism. They tend to challenge and sabotage treatment because they really do feel disempowered, like things are being done for them, to them, not necessarily with them on board. And they tend to employ very maladaptive coping styles. So a lot of denial. I'm not as sick as these people say I am, why are they making such a fuss? Um, I already have the disease, what's the point? So there's this passivity, like it's not like I can do anything. There's a lot of helplessness. You know, nobody seems to want to help me. I keep asking for help and nothing's happening. So to go back to the cue cards, um, the left side of the room was gonna write down um, a two line statement basically that was frequently made by um, a patient during a difficult interaction. Um, so can a couple of people maybe just read out some of those uh, statements? Okay, and so going back to why this topic is important, we can certainly see how coping styles make a difference in how people see their illness, how willing they are to engage in treatment, how much uncertainty they're willing to tolerate. Um, so when you look at other things that are required for the management of HIV, there's the biomedical where they need to adhere to a medication regimen, they need to engage in health maintaining behavior, and on the psychological level, they have to have enough cognitive flexibility to tolerate uncertainty, right? So they can do everything that's required for their treatment, but the physiological course sometimes is at odds with their particular efforts to get, you know, on top of the illness. Um, and there's also issues around self-agency. Do they see themselves as being able to um, be involved directly in their treatment? Do they see themselves as having an impact on the course of their illness? 
or do they see themselves as being helpless, much as you just talked about? And how, how able are, there, are they to form trust in relationships? And this is really important when you look at um, alliance with the treatment team. People who have a fundamental mistrust um, in others, you know, doubt our motives, may actually look at uh, the treatment th team and think, well, you know, there they go. They're getting paid to do their work, but they don't really want to help me. They're not really all that interested. I'm not going to get better. I already have HIV. So these are, when you look at these three pieces that are required for a successful treatment, um, these are very challenging tasks for people with personality disorders, especially those who have extroverted personality disorders or high energy personality disorders as cluster B is sometimes called, so the bad cluster. Now, the presence of uh, certain personality traits, as I mentioned earlier, and certain personality disorders are very concerning risk factors. So, they certainly increase the risk of acquiring HIV, which I know in this setting isn't all that important because you work with people who already have HIV, but it also has a direct impact on the course of illness, the progression of illness. So um, in people with a triple diagnosis in particular, their personality traits are you know, at the forefront in terms of how they approach their treatment and what the course of illness is really. If the substances are being used as a primary coping, then no matter how helpful the treatment um, program is, it can only go so far. Now, this, this all really underscores how important it is to recognize some of these personality traits and try and think you know, very consciously, well, how can I make this a more meaningful interaction and incur encourage this patient in um, feeling empowered and involved in their own treatment plan? So other reasons why personality is so important. So, um, I mean, personality really develops from our very early formative experiences. In the case of those with personality disorders, it's particularly those negative formative experiences with their attachment figures, be it mom, dad, or whoever is looking after them under the age of, say, three years old that make a difference. So whatever unresolved emotional experiences they have tend to be expressed through acting out, for example, with us. As we discuss with them why they're not engaging in treatment, we might be perceived as being the punishing parent, you know? It's not something they're doing volitionally, it's just that as soon as they have an interaction with someone of that stature, automatically they're back in that mode where this is how they interact with that person, the punishing parent. Now, we need to be able to see these interactions as essentially reenactments of what this person has experienced in, you know, earlier in their lives specifically traumatic incidents that the care environment might remind them of being disempowered. Now, it's important to, to try and develop more therapeutic ways of interacting with so-called difficult patients for this particular reason. So if they're interacting with us and their automatic reaction is that that they had during whatever negative incident, well, it's very unlikely they're going to agree with us, regardless of how helpful our suggestions might be. So obviously personality disorder characteristics, our personality precedes acquisition of HIV or any other infection. Um, but most people, with, uh, most people living with HIV are unaware that they have a personality disorder. So they view their behavior as being reactive to provocation, right? So it's not me, it's them. They are doing X, Y, Z to me. That's why I have to react the way they do. I have to stand up for myself. So it's very egocentric behavior, which is viewed as being unrelated to their HIV positive status. Yes? For most people who are HIV, uh, sorry, who are not, most PDs who are not HIV positive, are they aware of the, the... No, so in general, general, people who have personality disorders are not aware. And they're not aware for at least three different reasons. They're not aware because they lack that ability, like the insights, but also we're very reluctant to give feedback to others about having personality disorders. There's a lot of stigma. But the other piece as well is that, you know, um, when we talk about personality disorders, a lot of the times, depending on the setting, we may not view pers like the personality traits as indicative of a personality disorder. So, Again, you know, like their behavior is like egocentric. This is their way of dealing with the world. This is their worldview, right? And so what we might consider to be very, very disruptive behavior, they say, yeah, well, you know, I'm just being me, just standing up for myself, being passionate, right? Okay, so 
what are the most common personality disorders in people living with HIV? I mean, we talked about how prevalent personality disorder is in people living with HIV. I'm wondering though, from your perspective, you know, are there any particular types of um, personality traits or clusters or disorders, whichever you want, that you tend to see more of? Sorry, cluster B, okay. And what kind of work do you do? Social, Social work, okay, so cluster B. Anybody else? Any other types of personality traits or clusters or disorders they seem to encounter quite a bit in their frontline work? So the cluster C is the anxious, fearful cluster. So, you know, the dependent personality, the avoidant personality. Cluster C, yeah. Okay, so cluster B and C. Anybody else? Okay, and just generally speaking, I mean, if you had to guess which cluster was most represented in people living with HIV, or which particular personality disorder, whatever you prefer, which which would you say? Sorry? B. B and A. A, okay. Anybody else? Someone shout out C, and then we have all three of them. <laughs> yeah, so, um, I mean, the cluster B personality disorders are the most frequently seen. When you consider that half of the people living with HIV have a substance use disorder, it makes sense that it's cluster B, because these are the high energy, impulsive, risk-taking personality disorders, so you're antisocial, who frequently commits crimes, or who frequently engages in very asocial behavior. The person with a borderline personality disorder who self suits by using substances, by being sexually promiscuous. The histrionic personality disorder who's very seductive and needs to be the center of attention and therefore will do whatever they need to do to remain the center of attention. The narcissistic personality disorder who really has a hard time feeling any empathy for other people who gets through life by manipulating others to do what they want. So these are all personalities that are more likely to engage in impulsive behavior, such as the risk factors for HIV, and that's why we see them most commonly in people with HIV AIDS. Any questions or comments so far? All right. So what might cluster B look like, um, you know, in a care setting? So they may be unable to tolerate anxiety, limits, boundaries. They may be very, very divisive and actually employ very sophisticated skills seemingly to us to split staff and to split residents. Um, they might very, very rapidly idealize and value the same person. They might talk about, oh, there's Dr. Kravalhal, the one who, did, who never helps me. And oh my gosh, there's Dr. Smith, the one who always helps me. And then the next day they, they flip that around. So a lot of idealization and devaluation. A sense of entitlement, very, very unreasonable demands, which need to be met like now, now, now. Otherwise, I'm just gonna, you know, have a temper tantrum. Um, a lot of lashing now, a lot of mood swings, a tendency to blame others, and a failure to accept responsibility. So let's look at Rod's case. So Rod is 46. He actually self-initiated admission for to the HIV AIDS hospice due to his low CD4 settings, uh, CD4 counts. His family do not visit. In fact, his wife has actually told staff that this is a huge respite for the family because it's been difficult with his mood swings and his threats to overdose on his medications, which he had previously been stockpiling. Now, once he's in the um, facility, staff noticed that a lot of the co-patients will go out of their way to avoid him or they walk on eggshells around him. He's a very polarizing force. He frequently splits staff by pitting one against the, the other to have his needs met like immediately. And he'll often be very verbally abusive. He talks about the incompetent ones with respect to staff and, the, um, and idealizes the good ones, which he tends to spread to other patients and tell them, well, don't let nurse A help you. She's not very helpful. This is the really good nurse. Uh, so staff have also been limiting their encounters with Rod because of his mood swings, his unreasonable demands. Staff described feeling very, very angry or hostile following encounters with Rod. In addition, the staff actually disagree as to how, how important it is to hold Rod to his treatment contract, um, which clearly outlines what the program standards are for behavior and consequences for unacceptable behavior. 
So what are our striking personality traits in Rod? Anything that strikes you about his personality traits? I'll just go back. <laughs> yeah. So he's hard to like. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yep. Any others? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So. No ability to trust at all with this person. That's right. Which you like to do patients and Yeah. Yeah. And people are walking on eggshells around this guy, right? Like they just they have a hard time dealing with his personality. That's right. So he, it's. It's always a, it's a bit disheartening to have family express that, you know, this is a bit of a reprieve. It's been really difficult and all of that. So now, any other questions you might have about his presentation? Yes? Do, do people like him have insights into the fact that he only knows what he wants? Everybody wants to come and say, right. do they, when they, when they realize that? Not quite. <laughs> Not in this particular case. <laughs> yes. For sure. Any thoughts about staff? Go ahead. <laughs> so, what the research states is that multiple diagnosed can cause uh, personality disorder? Um, so, it states that um, there are many diagnoses that can look like personality disorder. But personality disorder is distinct because these traits and this behavior is always present, pretty much since they're like, you know, in their late teens. And that's how you distinguish them. And we generally never make the diagnosis of personality disorder when someone is, say, in a delirium or in an acute um, medical state. So we diagnose that just depending on the patient history? So patient history, any collateral you can get from elsewhere, but also observation, right? So you wouldn't make it based on one interaction. He's been in this um, setting for, say, X number of weeks, and every day it's sort of the same patterns that emerge. And then you're starting to think, this is more likely, you know, a personality disorder than anything else, right? I would think the consistent response of staff would be a major issue for staff morale as well as for him to see that each one is responding in the same way. Yeah. That's a difficult Yeah. So staff morale is, it's quite important. And what we notice about Rod is that um, he, the staff, there's a lot of dissension among staff. So somehow this patient has managed to create so much um, conflict, not just amongst co-patients, but at the staff level, that staff have very different, different opinions about how to actually hold him to the standards of the program. So um, obviously, negative impact on staff morale. Any other thoughts about um, staff morale? Yes. Um, I have a client, a uh, very uh, similar kind of um, presentation of this. And um, we've actually, it, it got so difficult in terms of having staff all have the same kind of limit setting. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we've actually had to minimize, minimize the staff and deal them. Right. And then that just creates more of that frustration burden on most Few people. That's right. So it's such a challenge because we're like, it doesn't work if we do it the other way, but at mm -hmm. the same time, like, it's, like the people that are constantly with them are feeling like Burned a out. lot of burden. Yeah. Yeah. Burden. yeah. Well, that's a really good point. And I know in the research, there's a lot of, you know, discussion about what's the best way of handling this. Do we, is it better to select, say, the three or four individuals who work best with this particular patient? and spare the other's exposure because it's usually a very unproductive interaction? Or should all staff be trained and should whoever is assigned deal with this patient? And there's never really been agreement. I mean, in some facilities, it is the case. They identify primaries who can deal with the patient fairly well, and the rest tend to not uh, deal with the patient. But again, it's, it's hard to say which is the better approach. <laughs> this is interesting in a control setting, like most of us working, mm -hmm. but those who work in 519, it's a come and go whenever they want. It must make it very difficult for them to figure out how to handle them, what to do, but they probably did all the reasons. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I'm hoping at the latter half of the talk, we're going to touch on some of that. Now, why is it that patients like Rod can trigger such... I was just going to say, for me, I think it sort of goes the opposite way. If I walk into a nursing station, for example, or 
the clinical settings that I see two staff passionately arguing about the patients. Mm -hmm. I would think, oh, personality disorder. Like, that. I always go the other way. Like, yeah. it's, 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 like, it's always a, a tip off to me when the staff are just really no, yes, mm -hmm. no, yes, yes, about the patient's personality or support care. Okay. And I think, oh, Yeah, and you certainly read my next slide, so um, <laughs> no worries, no, this is good. So why Rod is able to trigger such um, a reaction in us? Well, you know, they, there's, their very self-destructive behaviors are seemingly at odds with their expressed recovery goals. So he's come in paradoxically stating that he wants to get better, but at the same time, he's help rejecting. In fact, he is help polarizing. And he's very, very manipulative. And one of the flags that's frequently raised um, in this sort of setting is when a particular patient has very different, manages to polarize staff to the extent that one staff doubts their particular ability to deal with the patient and the other staff says, oh, no, 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 it's all been good. There's nothing going on here, you know? And so they're engaging in a battle of wills. So staff and staff are engaging in a battle of wills about this patient. That's very, very, that's suggestive. That's certainly something to pay attention to. Yes? What I find also very difficult about his, his case is that, um, is that using his engagement in care or treatment as, as something he threatens, right? Mm -hmm. That makes it so difficult for healthcare providers taking care of him because it's using, like, well, I'm not going to you know, go to this appointment or take this and yeah. you know, do this for me. Or it makes it like there's a, like an added layer of, of difficulty in there, right? Because for sure. So, so keen. Yeah, yeah, great point. Yeah. This may be a naive theory. Maybe, maybe he, in fact, is getting help in some way, shape, or form that the caregiver doesn't receive or is not up to the standards of what he should be providing. Mm -hmm. For sure, and I think this sort of goes to be the bit maybe about. It's just a small, we expect too much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think this goes to some of the discussion around, um, you know, training and ability to recognize um, our particular limits and when it might be that we're actually not able to help the patient and this other person might be able to do so. So earlier, we're going back to the cue cards again. <laughs> One more exercise. So um, you had written down how the interactions made you feel. So. Um, can some people read out some of their cue cards? How how do they feel during these difficult interactions? Overwhelming. Sorry? Overwhelming, Overwhelming. yes, okay. Frustration. Frustration. Confused and apprehensive. Anger. Confused. And apprehensive. Apprehensive, for sure, yeah. 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 So sorry. Avoidant. Avoidant, yeah, yeah, for sure. So I mean a lot of strong uh, negative emotion, right? So, I mean, we feel anxious, we feel embarrassed, we feel overwhelmed, we're confused. Some of us are annoyed while others are angry. This person has this ability to, to induce so much negative emotion. And during the interaction, you know, some of us feel incapable, which we have some degree of shame about admitting to our coworkers because we wonder, well, does that speak to my abilities or is it just the patient, right? So there's also a sense of shame and a sense of being incapable in that particular interaction. Now, go ahead. Sometimes this is also a sign for me when I'm, when, in the beginning when I'm starting to like, get the sense of their idea personality disorder, when you hear clients talk about basically how they have a graveyard of people that used to help them in the past. Yeah. And they maybe start like, you're, yeah, you're, you're, like you're, yeah, I think you're doing this person, this person, this person, this person, like this agency, this, you know, they did this to me, and, they, and then you start to realize, well, they, yeah, why is there such a large people and people that are wrong, right? Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah, a lot of people that went through Great that. point, oh, yeah. Things. So burned out, they burn their bridges and they burn us out. And, you know, if we have anything to do with their prior healthcare providers, they might describe some of the same emotions we see here, right? Feeling very stressed out, feeling very, very anxious, and really just wanting to avoid this very unpleasant person. Now, what about the patient? I mean, what, what is the patient likely feeling during this encounter? What, what kind of feelings do you think they're experiencing? I would kind of fear and anger frustration. Okay, fear, anger, frustration. Mm -hmm. 
persecuted now? Yes, and that's a very important um, experience to recognize because it goes towards how we actually approach the patients in future interactions, right? So they feel persecuted, but in addition, they feel very, very validated. No matter what they do, they can't seem to get the help that they need. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's a very isolating experience when repeatedly in your encounters, you get the same sort of negative interaction and you're not sure why. So the one thing I sort of notice as you read out some of the emotions you experience, some of what you think they might have been experiencing is the fact that there's a lot of overlap between the two, right? So, um, we, you know, we talked about them feeling anxiety, sadness, confusion, frustration, anger, all of those things which we've also described experiencing, right? And the overlap really shows some very classic effects of the interaction. So they talk about, you know, transference, countertransference, and basically it's really describing the fact that the patient is able to transmit a lot of their fear, anxiety, their sense of a lack of control and inadequacy to us, their anger at their perceived lack of control. And on our part, we're receiving um, these emotions, we're receiving this particular interaction, and we're actually experiencing a very similar sensation. So as, you know, despite our training, despite our what we think are our therapeutic skills, we're not getting anywhere, we're starting to feel frustrated, and you know, at a very basic level, we're starting to feel very incapable. No matter what we see or what we do, despite our training and our best intentions, nothing seems to be working. And so we're also responding to some of our own UG templates, right? So perhaps we have others in our lives who make us feel this way and this patient represents that particular person. So there's this push me pull you, right? So the patient is transmitting all sorts of things. We're receiving it, we're repackaging it. Sometimes we're repackaging it with a very flawed lens based on our particular experiences. And it just results in this very, very counterproductive atmosphere. So, I mean, what can we learn from these interactions? These are, all, these are not all bad things. I mean, each interaction is a very teachable moment, right? So the patient subconsciously expect reenactment. We have to remember that piece, it's subconscious. They expect a reenactment of their previous experiences, right? And, but what we can do is listen to their stories about their relationships and their past experiences. It reflects their outlook. So what does it tell us? I mean, what are their characteristic patterns of relating to others? What are their characteristic behavior and coping patterns? What are their underlying beliefs? How do they think the world sees them? And how do they feel they need to interact with the world because of the way that the world sees them? So these we can all sort of take and make inferences about, and we can use it to refine our future interactions with the patients, right? So how do we actually address treatment or management? I mean, if it was this easy, we probably wouldn't be here. So, <coughs> I mean, at the very, very formal level, um, we talk about a number of different types of modalities. So social skills training, behavioral techniques, CBT principles for anxiety, anger, dysfunctional beliefs that result in maladaptive behavior. We talk about DBT to look at um, mood regulation and distress tolerance. We know that a lot of patients will talk about I've been in therapy forever, and these are insight-oriented. It's meant to help them gain insight into their particular role in their difficulties. And, you know, there are a number of other important associated modalities, particularly motivational interviewing, especially in those with the triple diagnosis, in addition to which there is mindfulness. Oops. So none of these are practical or feasible in terms of applying them at the frontline setting. And we don't need to be like schooled in these particular uh, modalities. What we need to be able to do is actually use those principles. So we use some of those principles from CBT or DBT, the cognitive principles to try and shift feelers to thinkers. When we think about cluster B, the reason that they seem to escalate so quickly is because they, they act on very intense emotions and quickly lash out. There is no time to actually like consider, you know, what might be the, what might be the likely outcome, the long-term consequence of me responding in this way. That doesn't take place because they have such intense and shifting emotions. They don't have time to engage in that particular piece. 
So our job, though, is to try and use some of the cognitive principles to help them shift from being feelers to being thinkers, people who think a little before they act. We can also help coach patients to use mindfulness techniques. Um, we can certainly use like a, a motivational approach to try and help the patient look at, well, this is what I'm doing right now, and these are my professed goals. Is there a discrepancy between how I'm acting and what I've professed to be my long-term goals? So helping them see that discrepancy might help them to sort of come to the understanding that there are things they can do to make, to like bridge that gap. And we might be able to use functional skill, functional analysis techniques such as um, behavioral chain analysis, which I've labeled BCA, to explore some of these difficult interactions. Anyone who uses behavioral chain analysis? So behavior chain analysis basically looks at shifting people from action to ration, shift from feeling to thinking a little bit more. So we look at this prompting event and we look back, well, what was the patient experiencing at the time? You know, were they feeling, were they in pain? Were they feeling stressed out? Were there environmental stressors? Were they in withdrawal? And what happened? What was the nature of the event? And what was the outcome of those events, you know? And so we look at these distinct pieces and we try and help the patient sort of create the links. You know, I was feeling this way and as a result, I did X, Y, Z. My thought, I was thinking that, you know, um, I wasn't gonna get what I wanted. I was feeling very, very persecuted and I felt I had to do this and that. And we look at the problem behavior and we help them explore whether did it achieve what you wanted it to what you wanted it to achieve, or do you feel like it's been a setback? And what are the consequences of that particular incident? Like not just short term, but long term, you know, like what do you think is gonna happen? So help them explore it, but make sure that they're sort of there behind the wheels telling you what they experienced, what they were hoping to get out of the interaction and what they see as the consequences, right? So with each, like I said, with each difficult interaction, it's a teachable moment because it forms a template for our future interactions with this patient, right? Because the patient and ourselves take away this residue from the interaction. As we approach future interactions with this patient, we have that residue and we're already feeling, oh, I have to deal with Mr. Smith again. Here we go. So, you know, sort of being a little bit more conscious of that and trying to use some of the principles I just talked about in the interaction, in addition to using mindfulness for ourselves, which I'm going to come to shortly. So the main thing to remember is that in the high energy cluster, they're very, very feeling oriented versus cognitively oriented. So we need to help them shift the balance, right? So how do we break the, the uh, chain at the staff level? Any suggestions or thoughts, like things you've used, for example, in the past when you've tried to explore this link with patients? So, I mean, it's really important to address the self-work piece because um, patients with personality disorders, can, they can evoke such intense emotions for the people around them. And it's really hard to process the feeling. We know that we feel frustrated, angry, whatever other negative feeling, but we don't quite understand why it keeps happening, right? And the other issue is that, you know, as we alluded to earlier, the feelings that I experience may actually completely contradict the feeling that the other staff member does. And so it can be very invalidating for the one person while for the other person, they don't particularly see a problem. They just think that while their colleague maybe isn't up to the task or their colleague is too sensitive. And so again, goes back to the, not just your um, self work, but the environment around you. Are your colleagues supportive? Is it a safe environment to debrief and ask for help? And so, you know, the main thing is that staff can feel very, very isolated from each other and be very vulnerable to burnout. So even if you see differences in how you interact with patients, it's really important to be able to you know, give a pat on the back to your colleague who's feeling particularly stressed out about this interaction, offering a kind word, you know, like basically team building, team building right? <coughs> so the other um, self-work using introspective techniques and self-awareness. So 
like I mentioned earlier, you want to think about what stressors you are carrying before you approach this difficult patient, what your triggers were, who does the patient represent for you? You know, do they remind you of somebody else in your life? Like, or is this being incorporated into your, into your interactions? What's the team's united approach? Is there a, do you have a staff member that you can reliably debrief with without judgment? I mean, technically all your colleagues should be available for that purpose, but it's not always the case. And do you, do you feel like you truly contribute to a, you know, a supportive, non-judgmental team environment? If you don't, how can you make that more possible? Are you comfortable with using time and space as tools as we previously discussed? So how do we approach patients with personality disorders? So, I mean, I think we already touched on this before. You want to make sure that there are any comorbidities present have been ruled out and treated as appropriate. So if they have what we previously described as access one disorders, you want to make sure their anxiety is treated. You want to make sure that they're, they're receiving help with their addictions disorder. And because if they're not, then this really clouds any sort of movement with their difficult interactions, right? We want to make sure we engage in effective communication. We really, really, really want an integrated interdisciplinary team approach. So having, you know, a staff that's very homogeneous is not particularly beneficial. We want staff from varying disciplines who each have something to contribute to the environment, right? We want a very effective treatment plan, obviously. <laughs> So effective communication would take the form of active listening, body language. You know, you want to you want to be very firm but non-judgmental. You really, really want to work on diffusing any notion of power play. It's important to try and involve the patient in their care so they feel empowered, like they're in the driver's seat with you. You're helping to you're helping them navigate, but they're actually doing the driving. You want to offer options whenever it's feasible so that they're they remain active throughout the course of their treatment. And, you know, again, going back to time and space being underappreciated tools. And other aspects of the integrated team approach. So shared care, like I mentioned, various disciplines and specialties involved. Supportive settings. So staff being able to use the team as a very supportive and non-judgmental space to debrief and seek support. Being able to establish clear and consistent strategy about when to support and when to actually confront the patient. Um, talking about how to minimize the patient's ability to be very divisive, not only among school patients, but amongst staff. And then as we've talked about, you know, staff education, there's nothing more helpful than ongoing professional development and education, skill enhancement and training, team building to um, work on morale. Other aspects of effective management. So we, a lot of times we develop treatment <coughs> programs that focus a lot on, you know, the medication and the expected gains. We might forget the behavior piece, but it's really important to have both in the treatment plan. We want to establish a behavioral contract um, collaboratively within the team, but with the patient's input. We want to make sure a copy is available to the patient and to the staff as well, so that they can frequently refer to it as needed. So we talked about the behavioral contract and in some settings they talk about using tokens, for example, people collecting tokens and cashing it out for some sort of a reward. And this is used quite frequently where there's a lot of cluster B personality disorders and really they're not risk averse, like their risk drives them, they're impulsive, but they respond to rewards. So we want to be able to have something like that in our contract. Um, and, you know, one thing that I think, you know, comes up quite a bit is that whenever <coughs> the treatment contract actually relies on a lot of um, threats and punishment, it never really works because, like I said, these are not people who are um, averse to risk, right? They're very impulsive. So it doesn't work for cluster B. It might work for cluster C, though, because they're very risk averse and they're excessively compliant. So Tad is a 33-year-old male with AIDS described his pre-HIV life as in very, very grandiose terms, certainly not in keeping with his current presentation, lives with his family who support him because he really refuses to have anything to do with like, you know, earning for himself. So feels very entitled. At the program, he tends to manipulate um, 
clients into giving him money. So there's a lot of ill will towards him from co-patients. Uh, and the staff describe him as being a pathological liar. Uh, he induces a lot of negative feelings all around. So the one problem that they had consistently was around um, a dermatological problem he had. So he had a medical condition, left the skin around his genitals dry, flaky, and itchy. And on many occasions, he's observed to be scratching himself, smelling his hands, and just flicking it across the room. No respect for others around him. He's handling food. He's not washing his hands. But the thing is, staff are so appalled, they're literally immobilized. They don't know what to do with this guy. So in this particular case study, they brought in someone who, who dealt a lot with um, personality disorders and you know, giving them suggestions around how to work with um, personalities such as Tad because there's a lot of burnout in the staff and staff just felt like they couldn't do anything anymore. And their, I mean, their management plan was relatively uh, simple. They engaged in a team consultation, they involved Tad, and what they came up to basically was a contract that stated that, you know, stop scratching, there's added PRN relief. It all seems very common sense, but this is what they did. And, you know, they agreed with him. If it comes to a point where the itching is so bad, the PRN isn't working, that, um, you know, he can't stop himself from scratching in public, then he gets discharged home. To their surprise, despite, despite the simplicity of the plan, it actually worked and he was able to, you know, um, hold himself to those standards. He did leave the program AMA, but they weren't sure what the reasons were. But for the duration of his, the remainder of his stay, he was able to act within the confines of the contract. Yeah. So that will bring us to um, our summary. So I think, you know, I've sort of expressed that personality disorders are a very common comorbidity amongst people living with HIV. I mean, 20 to 40 percent of them have a personality disorder. And it's really important to recognize personality disorder traits because it has a strong impact on treatment, strong impact on the progression of the disease itself. And education and skills development are very essential tools for staff development, managing staff morale. And finally, uh, the self-awareness piece is essential for a mindful practice that reduces the likelihood of um, anti-therapeutic interactions and makes it more likely that over time, not immediately, we'll have perhaps like a few more minutes of productive interaction before things blow up. But the point being that we repeatedly use these skills and we continue to develop them. All right, that's it.